Today we're going to look at uh, the end of uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 12 and 13. So if you want to start flipping there on your app, I guess you don't have to flip an app, do you? But, um, yeah, if you want to look it up in your Bible, feel free. And let me just start by saying that um, it has been a wild couple weeks. Uh, it was a week from Sunday, or a week from tomorrow, actually, two weeks from tomorrow, when we found out that the church building had been sold. Um, and if you did hear that news, I'm sorry that that was the way it was just presented to you. Um, but yeah, the church building had been sold, and we had no clue what was going to happen next. We, we didn't know if we needed to be gone in 30 days, or 60 days, or 90 days. Um, we jumped out of an airplane with John and Mary and Mark. I had no clue what was going to happen with that. And I remember uh, messaging a friend of mine as I was heading up there that said, um, it's been great knowing you, just in case I don't know. <laughs> um, you never know what's going to happen. And um, and then yesterday, I was actually marrying this young couple who are, I don't know, 22, 23 years old. They have no clue what they're getting themselves into. <laughs> and here they are making promises to each other that are going to last a lifetime. And, and we're going through the vows, and they were very traditional vows, but for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. And I'm sitting there thinking, any of these things could happen in their lives, and likely will happen in their lives at some point or another. And um, here they are promising something in the midst of it. Um, but they have no clue what they're going into. And, and I have to say, in the midst of all of this, um, New adventures are abounding, there's excitement, uh, but there's also a lot of anxiety and stress, and, and I can only describe it as sitting at the edge of uh, a big fog bank going, I know we're going forward, but I really don't have any vision for what that's going to look like. Um, and then it struck me that we have all been there many, many times in our lives, and we'll be there again. Um, and one of the most frequent prayers that I have been asked to pray for people and that I've prayed myself is, God, would you give me some clarity about the choices that I'm about to have to make or about what's about to happen? Because uh, life can be confusing. It's not always crystal clear, and it's hard to figure out what to do at certain points. What do I say to this person in my family who I care about? Where do I put the boundaries? Should I move or not? What's going to happen with my job? Uh, how's this new venture going to work out? Um, and I think there's something that makes the difference between moving into this with excitement and adventure and with wide open spaces and with life and for this just to be stressful and anxiety ridden and to drag us down. Um, there are two things. I was a Boy Scout um, for many, many years. My dad was a Boy Scout sort of like, I don't know what they were, the den, den master or whatnot for Cub Scouts and then in Boy Scouts. And um, I love Boy Scouts somewhat. Most of the stuff I didn't really care about, the badges and stuff, I'm like, all right, I got my music badge because I could play a song on the recorder, and uh, it didn't really impress me. But there were two things I really liked. Knives and axes. You got a special <laughs> getting trained in those. What middle schooler doesn't want to play with knives and axes? So I thought that was pretty neat. But the other one uh, was orienteering. Orienteering to me was absolutely fascinating because you can be somewhere that you have never been. You can have a compass and a map, and you can get yourself from here to there without getting lost. And I just thought that was the coolest thing, to be able to explore somewhere that I had never been to know where I was going. Um, and uh, today, I kind of named the sermon, like, Orienteering with Jesus, because I want to look at some things that um, take these times that we're stepping into the unknown and um, help us to orienteer them with Jesus so that we can experience life and adventure through them instead of anxiety and stress. So, here we go. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 12 and 13, and yes, I ran across this, across this while preparing for this wedding. I'm like, oh, that's a cool ending to the chapter. I should <laughs> preach on that. So, um, here it is. Now we see but a poor reflection, as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. God, um, thank you for your word. 
Thank you for giving us solid places, even though we can't see fully and even though we can't know fully right now. Um, you give us some things that do remain and that are stable and uh, create space for us to walk with you. So, Lord, lead us in this work. We love you. Amen. So Paul's painting a picture here um, of, of, of recognizing that he can't see it all. Uh, it, it, if you've ever been to a carnival, they can sometimes have a, like a hall of mirrors, and you see those like <laughs> twisted mirrors, and you go up to one, and you might uh, be a tall person, and then you look in the mirror, and suddenly you're like, this no, that's kind of cool. Uh, I particularly like the one where you're a wider person, and you stand in front of it, and suddenly you're skinny, but um, <laughs> that's about the only way I'm going to get there. So, uh, But he's painting this picture of not seeing things clearly, and he recognizes it. But then he says, there will come a time when I can see really clearly. There will come a time when, when I will see things as they are. But until then, there's some things that remain. Faith, hope, and love. And these are the tools that God gives us to walk as we walk by faith and not by sight. There's a young man who, I, I might have told this story before, but I love it. This young man went to um, spend some time with Mother Teresa at uh, her home for the sick and dying in India, and he uh, was taking some time to go there, and she asked him why he came to this place, and, and he said, well, I came here because I'm not sure what to do with my career. I'm not sure about a choice I need to make. Um, and so he said, Mother Teresa, if you wouldn't mind, could you please pray for clarity for me because I have to make this career decision? And um, she said, I, I won't pray for clarity for you. I'll pray for trust, though. You can trust Jesus as you move forward. Um, have you ever been on a trust walk? It's this weird thing where you like blindfold one person and then another person leads them along to, from one place to another. And um, I've led a lot of trust walks. I've been on a trust walks. I still don't feel comfortable being the blindfolded person. John has been on more trust walks than anybody. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. Um, but as a youth director, I remember like, Initially, I started setting up uh, these trust walks with two kids leading each other. And it didn't really work that well. And the reason why was because oftentimes there was at least a couple kids in the group who were like squirrely and would try to like trip their partner over rocks and through bushes and things like that. And, and the person wasn't trustworthy. But then when I switched it up and I said, you know what, we're going to have the kids walk with one of our adult chaperones who they know and who they trust. Everybody's anxiety level just went down. They were able to experience this sense of being led um, a lot better because they had somebody that they could trust. And as we step into the unknown, as we make decisions, as we uh, think about those prayer requests we just had, man, everybody's life is changing. Your mom's life is in the middle of change. Your mom's life is in the middle of change. Our lives are in the middle of change. And, and as we step forward, we want clarity. We want to know the crystal clear path. We want to know all the boundaries and all the plans and be in control. But the reality is we often don't. But instead we have the Lord and we have to make a decision. Do we trust him enough? Are we okay being led by him into the unknown? I think the illusion of wanting clarity and wanting things to be under our control is just that. We want God to tell us exactly how things are going to go, but oftentimes he doesn't. And I think even if he did, things might change along the way. Um, I think of Jonah. Jonah was asked to go to the city of Nineveh and declare its great downfall for its sin and iniquity. And he goes, no, I'm not going to do it. And so he runs the other way and God drags him back and he ends up doing it anyway. And the Ninevites are struck to the heart and they go, Okay, we repent. We put ourselves in the Lord's hands. We're going we're gonna to trust him, and maybe he'll have mercy on us. And God goes, you know what? I was going to destroy them, but now that they've changed directions, I'm not. And Jonah goes, I knew it. I knew you would change your mind. You'd have mercy on them because you're just too darn loving. And that's us. We walk through life. We don't know what's going to happen. We want God to tell us ahead of time. But God is loving enough. And he asks, do we trust you? Do we have faith? Because that's what faith is, is trust. Hebrews 12.1 defines faith this way. Faith is confidence in what we hope for. 
in certainty about what we can't see. Are we certain that being in the Lord's hands are a good place to be? Can that be enough for us to walk forward? Um, and when we face different options, faith reminds us that God is there with us, whichever way we go, whatever decisions get made. Um, and that reduces anxiety and defensiveness and fear because faith is the opposite of those things. We rest knowing we're in God's hands. And that's our anchor in the midst of uh, stepping into the unknown. But we may not have a lot of faith. And that's where Matthew 17 comes in. Um, in that chapter, some disciples uh, bring to Jesus this, this guy who's really um, sick. And they go, well, we've, we've dealt with this before. We know how to handle it. We'll just pray for him. And they pray for him, and he stays sick. And then they go to Jesus and go, Jesus, we did all the stuff we normally do to handle this sort of problem, and the problem is still there. We don't know what to do next. And Jesus goes, fine. And he heals the guy. And then they go, well, how come they can do that? And Jesus' answer is this. Because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed, that is like a tiniest tiniest bit of powder. A mustard seed is itsy bitsy. Tiniest shred of faith. You could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Um, which is probably a reference to um, Herod the Great who liked to show off how awesome he was by moving hills from one place to another. But he says, nothing will be impossible for you if you have faith as a mustard seed. The reality is we don't have to have a lot of faith. It's not, do we have enough faith for this to happen? Do we have a tiny bit of faith and will we exercise that little tiny mustard seed we have as we look out into the unknown? Rather than living out of fear or insecurity or relying on ourselves or trying to figure it all out. I think the disciples had faith, they just weren't exercising it very much. They had a machine that they had, they had their power, they kind of had a system that they used. And instead, Jesus says, just use that little bit of faith you have, trust. I've got this. When we found out that the church had been sold, I went into panic mode. And I, I called John and I go, John, I, I don't know what to do, but I, I have three good plans. And we have an elder meeting this Thursday. And here's my first three plans. And I want to bring these to the elders and see which one they like the best so that we can move forward because we got to go. And, uh, and John's advice to me was really helpful. He said, um, I'm trying to not quickly find a new plan, Chris. Um, let's trust that God is in the process and see where it goes. And it caused me to like step back a little bit and to pray a little bit more and to recognize that the ground wasn't as shaky as I thought and that my plans were not what we were looking for. No. We didn't need to find some sort of semi-plausible answer for the question at hand. We needed to trust the Lord. In our lives, it's tempting when things aren't clear to preemptively fix it, to gain control, to set out our boundaries, and to make some decisions, because we have to, especially when we're under stress to want to do that. And I think wisdom invites us to take a breath, right? To calm down, to trust instead of seek clarity, and to know that we are in God's hands. Faith is such a stabilizer in the midst of stress and anxiety. And it reminds us that we are not on our own. So that's the first anchor that we have. Um, that's the first bit that we get to orienteering for life with Jesus when we don't know by what's ahead. And the second thing is hope. Um, second gift from God is hope. And it's, it's, uh, it's another wonderful gift in times of anxiety and stress and uncertainty. And I just want to ask a quick question. What are some things that you hope for? What do you hope for? Good health. Good health. Absolutely. We're only hoping for health. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we find a new place. Yeah, I hope the church finds a new place. That'd be nice. Um, for my children and grandchildren, that they'll uh, come to know the Lord and have rich and fulfilling lives even after I'm gone. Oh yeah. For the future generations. Yeah. I'm hoping that in Venezuela that 
change. Yeah. I think we're going to actually have to leave. That the hospital system will come out in the Middle Ages, and the doctors won't have to be writing orders when the doctor's body slips from the bank and never the page. They have no water. Yeah, I think that's. Or is that not? Whole groups of people who need the Lord. We're going to move into that. Hope is always um, a look at the future that will be better than the place that we are today. Um, I got to be honest. Hope is a bit foreign for me. I'm not a big hoper. I have lots of other assets, but I am not big on hope. Um, I'm really good at adjusting to what life throws at me. I'm really good at being flexible. Uh, I'm good at accepting kind of what's what's given to me, but I'm not real good at hoping. And, and I think it comes from a fear of being disappointed. Um, but honestly, God is changing that in me. Um, and it doesn't have to do with the sense that I'm moving from a victory to another victory, and so therefore another victory is in the future. Um, it doesn't have to do with circumstances being awesome. Um, the hope that God is beginning to, to cook up in me is, is simply based on this. I believe that God is in charge. And I know that God is good, and therefore I know where God is taking us. Ultimately, I know that God will set all things right in the world. Venezuela won't be a place that doesn't have anything in heaven. Oh. Where we are headed is eternal life and life in abundance. And as God works, every time he works, life in abundance comes out of it. And so there begins to be this belief that, well, our hope for the future, yeah, we might have to leave this building. But it's probably because God has a better place for us and a place where we can be more of God's people and we can do more of what God wants to see done in the world. So that gives me great hope. Um, a couple years ago, the Seahawks won the Super Bowl. Yes, and it will happen again. <laughs> but I remember that year, they were a total second half team. And what that meant was that halfway through the game, you looked at them and you're like, man, they are losing. They are just playing horrible. They're down by 14 again. But you didn't worry about it because you're like, well, this happens every week. And sure enough, second half would roll out. They look like a totally different team. And then they win by like 20. And they just go crazy in the second half. And, uh, and so you face these discouragements, these unknowns, and you go, don't even worry about it. I know these guys. I know what they do. And so we're probably going to win. Um, Paul, as he's listing what it's like to face tribulations in Romans 5. He says, I, I rejoice when I face tribulations. And here's why. I rejoice because they create perseverance in me. And perseverance creates character. And character produces hope. And hope never disappoints me. And I think Paul had gone through enough challenges and enough troubles and enough unknowns for him to look and go, I know that the Lord's going to show up. And I know he's going to do some great stuff in me. And he's going to do some great stuff in the world. And he's going to bring good out of every situation. And so, I have hope. Paul could say, I have hope, as he's sitting in a prison with absolutely nothing, because he knew that God's presence was still at work. Hope comes from recognizing that God is in control and God is good. In The, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, great book. Um, Aslan is the character that represents God, and I love this quote. It represents God's presence in the world. And the kids hear about this fierce lion right at the beginning of that story. And, and they ask a, a fair question. They go, is Aslan safe? And Mr. Beaver, who knows Aslan well, and who's sort of the Christian character, says, well, of course he's not safe. He's not safe at all, but he's good, and he's the king, I tell you. Friends, our God is completely unpredictable. We do not know what is before us. But we do know that he's good and he's in charge. And that is enough for us to have great hope, whatever our circumstances are. Uh, I think it was that first week that Dave Doherty ran into my office and goes, so, church have a new place yet? <laughs> and, and it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing. And I go, of course. And this was randomly, like, I don't know where this came from. But I go, yeah, of course, of course, the church has a new place. And he goes, oh, where is it? I go, I don't know, God hasn't told me. <laughs> We're kind of on a need-to-know basis. He's letting me know as we need to know, and apparently we don't need to know that yet. Um, 
But that's hope. That's what hope looks like. It's, it's confidence that God is going to do something better in the future because of who God is. And that's where we sit. That's where we sit in our lives. So we have faith. We can trust God. And then we have hope because we know where God is going to bring us. And so when we feel anxious or feel out of control, the way before us might be unclear, but we can trust God and we can have hope because of who he is. And then the last thing, the most important thing, actually, the whole thing that 1 Corinthians 13 is devoted to, the thing that Paul says that if we don't have this, we have absolutely nothing, and that is love. Um, in orienteering, if you have lots of food and lots of water, and you have a map, but you don't have a compass, you are not going to find your way. As a matter of fact, most people who get lost and wander, they wander in circles. And I thought that was kind of interesting because I have a tendency to wander in circles in my life and keep repeating the same things until God gets a hold of me and then gives me a new direction. Um, love is that vital element. It is that compass that leads us into something new. Um, so why is love so crucial? First of all, it's because love got us here. God in his great love loved us before we were even born, loved all of humanity. And um, in place at creation, Jesus said, yes, I love you enough to lay down my life for you so that I can bring you back. That's the story of Christianity. That's redemption. And redemption means we're going to a better place with Jesus because he loves us. Love is the ultimate keeper of that. And love automatically leads because of what we see on the cross. Greater love is no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends, is what Jesus said, and then he went and did it. At the cross, love leads to forgiveness and grace. Um, there, when you're stressed and when you're anxious and when you're heading into the unknown and you don't have a crystal clear path, there is one thing that is guaranteed, and that is that we will make mistakes. We're going to bump into things. Um, imagine if you're Indiana Jones and you're in a tomb, and suddenly a big wind blows through and all of the torches are blown out. You can do some things. You can sit down on the floor and wait and hope things get relit. I wouldn't suggest that option. Um, or you can start moving, hopefully slowly, not at a full run, but slowly moving forward. And eventually, what's going to happen? You're going to hit a wall. You're going to smash into something. You're going to, you're going to bonk. And uh, we're going to crash into each other. You're going to crash into a wall. You're going to make a mistake in terms of your course. And in those moments, you need room to bump into things and a buffer. And that buffer comes through love for one another. It comes through love from the Lord to know that there's grace and forgiveness here. Christina and I have a term in our relationship. Um, and I probably introduced it, and it's metal on metal. And it's that when there's no buffer, like when you're stressed and when you're anxious, when there's a lot going on, there's no buffer for giving grace to one another. It feels like metal on metal. And, and it, it comes into my mind in that moment when you hit the brakes in your car and you haven't changed the brake pads in a really, really long time, and you hear, and it's just rough. It sounds like something is being destroyed. I know that's a squealer, they probably did that on purpose, but um, that sense of metal on metal is not a good sound. Car crashes are not good sounds. You know that something is being broken. Um, another way to picture love, um, love is that pad that creates the space for you to actually stop some things. Another way to picture it is um, oil in an engine. You know, engines have all these moving parts, and they keep us moving forward. And um, if you take oil out of an engine, all those moving parts still go for a moment. And then they smash into each other and everything's destroyed. Uh, they grind to a halt. Um, if we don't have love for each other, for the world beyond us, from the Lord, for the Lord, um, everything in our life grinds to a halt and freezes up. Um, but with love, we're able to keep moving forward. And the grace that comes with it, that's what takes us from being fearful as we step into the unknown to stepping into an adventure. It's the shock absorber. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Um, we used it in that wedding yesterday. It says, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, it does not boast, it keeps no record of wrongs. Um, 
Kindness doesn't really matter except when people don't expect kindness back. Like, you go to a restaurant, everybody's kind of nice to each other as they're polite as they serve you and you reflect to them as you place your order, hopefully. Uh, but when somebody is rude to you, and then love is kind, and so you respond with great kindness, uh, picture going to David's she shirt as my, my uh, What's the name of it? The guy who gives me the drugs. Okay. <laughs> My pharmacy. I could be cranky. I could have a lot of pain going on. And I could be as rude to David Chisha as I want. I'm pretty sure he would respond with kindness. Um, it's just how I've experienced it. The kindness matters when it doesn't feel deserved. Why would Paul say love is patient? Except for there are times where we don't want to be patient. But love shows patience to one another. That's the buffer. Doesn't keep a record of wrongs. That's a gift. Because they can pile up pretty easy, especially when you're walking in the dark. God's love reminds us that we don't have to walk a narrow balance beam to try to stay on track with his love. Not with each other. Not with them. And uh, that creates wide open spaces for us to explore and to walk and to bump into things and to pick each other up when we fall. So as we step into the fog, um, faith, hope, and love make all the difference. My hope, my dream, my heart, as we step into this next season of our church is that we, the only thing we know for sure is things are going to change. And, and I can't tell you how excited I am for God to do some new stuff with us. I can't tell you how excited I am to see where God lands us and to see what ministries are available for us to do there and for us to be the people of God in that place and to see what new opportunities open up as a result of it. And it might be hard. It might not be as nice as this place. Um, and it might be better than this place. We don't know. But I know that this congregation has faith. It trusts the Lord. And I know that we have hope that God has taken us somewhere. And I know that we have love for one another. And so that gives me a heart to say, we are on a really, really good road. But I also know that if we don't have faith, and we don't have hope, and we don't have love for one another, this is going to be a rough time. It's going to be a rough season. And so I hope we can choose um, the former rather than the latter. I hope we can step into tomorrow with uh, this heart that Larry often expresses on Wednesday morning. Well, we're just going to see what the Lord has for us. Every day is like a big giant treasure hunt for Christmas because there's like presents waiting out there. Um, I think we can do that. So it'll come in the spirit of faith, hope, and love. So can we do that as we step forward together? Can we do that as we step into our lives and step into this next week? Just enter it with trust, grace, Faith, hope, love, and know that God has got us and that he's taken us to a good place. Sound good? Good. Yeah. All right, let's pray. God, we're in your hands. That's what we sung about, and we've sung about how good you are and how you move. And so, Lord, um, may we not rely on ourselves. May we not panic. May we not have anxiety. May we actually look at the reality that you have us we can trust you and that we're following you into whatever life brings next. Lord, in those moments when we want to rely on ourselves, turn our thoughts towards you. Help us to rely on you because it is in your hands uh, that we experience life, abundant life, wide open life. So Lord, grant us that and grant us love for one another. We love you. Amen. Amen.